Alice and the Griffin had not gone far before they came across the Mock Turtle in the distance, sitting sad and lonely on the edge of a rock. And as they came nearer, Alice could hear him sighing as if his heart would break. This here, young lady, said the Griffin, she just wants to know your history. <sighs> Once, said the Mock Turtle at last with a deep sigh, I was a real turtle. When we were little, we went to school in the sea. The master was an old turtle. We used to call him Tortoise. Why Tortoise if he wasn't one? Alice asked. Because he taught us, said the Mock Turtle angrily. Really, you are very dull. We had the best of educations. Reeling and writhing, of course, to begin with, and then the different branches of arithmetic, ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. I've never heard of uglification, Alice ventured to say. Well then, the Griffin went on, if you don't know what to uglify is, you are a simpleton. Alice said, what else had you learned? Well, there was mystery, the Mock Turtle replied, counting the subjects on his flappers. Mystery, ancient and modern, with seography, then drawling. The drawing master was an old conger eel that used to come once a week. He taught us drawling, stretching, fainting in coils. The classical master taught laughing and grief. And how many hours a day did you do lessons, said Alice, in a hurry to change the subject. Ten hours the first day, nine the next and so on. What a curious plan, exclaimed Alice. That's the reason they're called lessons, the Griffin remarked, because they lessen from day to day. That's enough about lessons, the Griffin interrupted. Tell her something about the games. The Mock Turtle sighed deeply and drew back one flipper across his eye. Would you like to see a little of the lobster quadrille? he said to Alice. Very much indeed, said Alice. Let's try the first figure, the Mock Turtle said to the Griffin. We can do it without lobsters, you know. Which shall sing? Oh, you sing, said the Griffin. I've quite forgotten the words. So they began solemnly dancing round and round Alice, every now and then treading on her toes and waving their forepaws to mark the time whilst the Mock Turtle sang this very slowly and very sadly. Will you walk a little faster, said a whiting to a snail. There's a porpoise close behind us and he's treading on my tail. See how eagerly the lobsters and the turtles all advance. They are waiting on the shingle. Will you come and join the dance? Will you? Won't you? Will you? Won't you? Will you join the dance? Will you? Won't you? Will you? Won't you? Won't you join the dance? Now, come, let's hear of some of your adventures, said the Griffin to Alice after the dance. So Alice began telling her adventures from the time she saw the white rabbit. After a while, a cry of the trial's beginning was heard in the distance. Come on, cried the Griffin, and taking Alice by the hand, it hurried off. What trial is it? Alice panted as she ran, but the Griffin only answered, come on, and it ran the faster. Chapter 6. Who Stole the Tarts? The King and Queen of Hearts were seated on their thrones when they arrived, with a great crowd assembled about them, all sorts of birds and beasts, as well as a whole pack of cards. The knave was standing before them, in chains, with a soldier on each side to guard him. And near the King was the White Rabbit, with a trumpet in one hand and a scroll of parchment in the other. In the very middle of the court was a table, with a large dish of tarts upon it. They looked so good that it made Alice quite hungry to look at them. I wish they'd get the trial done, she thought, and hand round the refreshments, but there seemed no chance of this. So she began looking at everything about her to pass away the time. Herald, read the accusation, said the king. On this, the white rabbit blew three blasts from the trumpet, then unrolled the parchment scroll and read as follows. 
The Queen of Hearts, she made some tarts all on a summer's day. The Knave of Hearts, he stole those tarts and took them quite away. Consider your verdict, the King said to the jury. Not yet, not yet, the rabbit hastily interrupted. There's still a great deal to come before that. Call the first witness, said the King. The first witness was the Hatter. He came in with a teacup in one hand and a piece of bread and butter in the other. I beg your pardon, your majesty, he began, but I haven't quite finished my tea when you called for me. Take off your hat, the king said to the hatter. It isn't mine, said the hatter. Stolen, the king exclaimed. I keep them to sell, the hatter added. I'm a hatter. Give your evidence, said the king. And don't be nervous, or I'll have you executed on the spot. Just at this moment, Alice felt a very curious sensation, which puzzled her a good deal until she made out what it was. She was beginning to grow larger again. I'm a poor man, your majesty, the hatter began it in a trembling voice. Only the March Hare said, I deny it, said the March Hare. Just take his head off outside, the Queen said to one of the officers. But the hatter was out of sight before the officer could get to the door. Call the next witness, said the king. Imagine her surprise when the white rabbit read out at the top of his shrill little voice the name Alice. Here, cried Alice, quite forgetting how large she had grown in the last few minutes. She jumped up in such a hurry that she tipped over the jury box with the edge of her skirt, upsetting all the jurymen onto the heads of the crowd below and there lay sprawling about, reminding her very much of a globe of goldfish she had accidentally upset the week before. Oh, I beg your pardon, she exclaimed, and began picking them up as quickly as she could. What do you know about this business? the king said. Nothing, said Alice. That's very important, the king said, turning to the jury. They were beginning to write this down on their slates when the white rabbit interrupted. Unimportant, your majesty means, of course, he said in a very respectful tone. Presently, the king, who had been busy for some time, writing on his notebook, called out, Rule 42, all persons more than a mile high are to leave the court. Everybody looked at Alice. I'm not a mile high, said Alice. You are, said the king. Nearly two miles high, added the queen. Well, I shan't go at any rate, said Alice. Besides, that's not a regular rule. You invented it just now. It's the oldest rule in the book, said the king. Then it ought to be rule number one, said Alice. The king turned pale and shut his notebook hastily. Consider your verdict, he said to the jury in a low, trembling voice. No, no, said the queen. Sentence first, verdict after. Stuff and nonsense, said Alice loudly. The idea of having a sentence first. Hold your tongue, said the Queen. I won't, said Alice. Off with her head, the Queen shouted at the top of her voice. Nobody moved. Who cares for you, said Alice. She had grown to her full size by this time. You're nothing but a pack of cards. At this, the whole pack rose up into the air and came flying down upon her. She gave a little scream and tried to beat them off and found herself lying on the bank with her head in the lap of her sister, who was gently brushing away some dead leaves that had fluttered down from the trees on her face. Oh, I've had such a curious dream, said Alice. And that was Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I do hope you enjoyed it, I certainly did. We have to make sure you come and join us again, me and some of my other friends on our amazing adventures here at Story Chest. Bye-bye.